Depending upon what part of the city you live in, I might be standing on top of the water that you'll use to brush your teeth tonight. What? If you live in a modern city like Toronto, the water supply is something you usually just take for granted. You turn on the tap and clean water comes out. But it can all go wrong in a hurry, as our friends in Calgary discovered earlier this year when a main feeder main broke, causing the city to live under extreme water restrictions for several weeks. There was a big water main break in Montreal this summer as well. The reservoir that I'm standing on is part of the system here in Toronto, but I'm going to take the advice of that song from The Sound of Music. Let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Behind me is the R.C. Harris Water Treatment Facility near Queen Street and Victoria Park Avenue. If you take the streetcar to come here, your streetcar will turn around at the easternmost point on Toronto's streetcar system. I talked about that in my video on the extreme ends of the streetcar system. There's a magic link up here, and I'll put a link down in the description so you can find it when you finish watching this video. This facility is named for longtime Toronto Public Works Commissioner R.C. Harris. You're probably familiar with a number of his other works, whether you know it or not. The most notable is probably the Prince Edward Viaduct, also known as the Bloor Danforth Viaduct. I did a video on that too, links in the usual places. This magnificent Art Deco facility, nicknamed the Palace of Purification, isn't just beautiful on the outside, it's lovely on the inside too even though hardly anybody gets to see it, at least not in person. This facility has been used as a movie set on a number of occasions, including for Bob and Doug McKenzie's movie, Strange Brew. This is the oldest and largest of Toronto's four water treatment plants, with a capacity just shy of a billion liters of clean drinking water a day. The process is pretty similar at all of them. The water is drawn in from pipes at the bottom of the lake quite a distance out there. It goes through several stages of filtration, after which there is a chemical treatment to kill any microbes. Like most plants, this one uses chlorine, although the newest plant, the F.J. Horgan plant in Scarborough, uses ozone, and the city is working on a project to replace the chemical treatment with ultraviolet light. And this is the island water treatment plant. You're smart enough to figure out where that is, right? This plant opened in 1977, but there have been water treatment plants on this site since the early 1900s. This is the smallest of Toronto's plants, with a capacity less than half that of the R.C. Harris plant. But there's something cool about this one. Literally, it helps with the air conditioning of a lot of Toronto's downtown buildings. A typical air conditioner works a lot like your fridge. There's a closed loop with a fluid in it. On one side of the loop, it absorbs heat from the thing that you're trying to cool. On the other side of the loop, it goes through a process that extracts the heat from the fluid and dumps it to the outside. But this process is very energy intensive. In fact, on the hottest summer days, about a third of Ontario's electrical use is for air conditioning. These plants draw their water from the bottom of Lake Ontario quite a bit out from the shore, and down there, the water is approximately four degrees year-round. Once the water has been treated here, it gets sent to our next stop, which is where the magic happens. You've probably seen the building behind me as you've been driving along the garden or the lake shore past the dome. And yes, of course, it's still the dome. This is the John Street pumping station. It's one of 18 stations in the system, although only 15 are located within Toronto, because Toronto's water supply also provides water to some parts of York and Peel. Pumping stations are not just needed to pressurize the water supply. They're also needed because the water comes from the lake, the lowest elevation in the city. And the highest point in the city is about 130 meters above lake level. The water isn't going to go uphill all on its own. This is where the cooling happens for the downtown office buildings. Remember I said that there's a fluid circulating that accepts the heat from whatever you're trying to cool. Well, in this building, there are heat exchangers between that fluid and the cold water coming up from the lake. The fluids never touch, but the heat is transferred, cooling the fluid that can then go back and cool the office buildings. It uses much less electricity than running large chiller systems for the air conditioning. While we're on the topic of pumping stations, I wanted to show you this building, the high-level pumping station on Poplar Plains Road. Built in 1906, it's another example of a building from an era when even 
utilitarian buildings had some effort put into their architecture. It looks nice on the inside too. All right, so now that we've got pumping stations to pump the water around, where does it go to after that? This is the obvious answer, a water tower. This one is on Talwood Drive in North York. It made a brief appearance in my video about the Don Mills Trail. You know where to find the links. Water towers are the obvious answer because they're, well, obvious. You kind of can't miss them. But if we don't count water towers that only serve the facility where they're located, then there are only four of them in Toronto, generally constructed in areas that were already built up enough that an underground reservoir just isn't practical. Remember this spot? It's where we started the video. This is the Ashtonby Reservoir Park, located on top of the Eglinton Reservoir. And no, I don't know why they didn't just pick one name and use it for both of them. It's one of seven underground reservoirs scattered throughout the city. There are also a few reservoirs outside the city for the same reason as the pumping stations outside the city. The water filtration plants also have some storage capacity in them, but nowhere near the capacity of a reservoir like this. Most of the reservoirs have a pumping station like this one attached to them. Of course, the water needs pipes to get around all the places we visited and out to customers, and the city has over 6,000 kilometers of water mains, with an average age of around 60 years. About 10% of them are between 80 and 100 years old, with about 15% over a century old. Not surprisingly, water mains break. The city usually sees over 1,000 water main breaks a year. But interestingly, it's not always the oldest ones that are the most likely to break. A lot of the water mains installed in the 1950s and 1960s are worse than older water mains because of a change in construction. Those water mains are largely installed in areas like Etobicoke, North York, and Scarborough that were undergoing rapid growth at around that time. As well, some parts of those cities have more acidic clay soils as opposed to the sandy soils in much of the rest of the city, so that can corrode the water mains from the outside in. In a typical year, Toronto replaces around 30 to 40 kilometers of water mains and rehabilitates over 100 kilometers more. We need to talk about poop. My cat doesn't have to concern herself with disposing of her poop. She has a servant for that. But when you or I flush the toilet, it comes to places like this, the North Toronto Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's in the Don Valley, and it made an appearance in my video on the Lower Don, yada, yada, yada. This is the second oldest and by far the smallest of Toronto's wastewater treatment plants, with a capacity less than 1 20th that of the largest one, the Ashbridge's Bay plant. This plant also differs from the others in that it's not close to the lake. It discharges its treated water into the Don River over there, which helps to maintain the flow of the river even during dry seasons, and apparently, in many cases, the water coming out of here is cleaner than the water that was already in the river. This plant is another of the works of R.C. Harris. Ultimately, the water flowing down the river, or coming out of any of the other wastewater treatment plants, ends up in the lake. Now, that's the same place we get our drinking water, but as long as it's treated properly on both ends, that's safe. On July 16th of this year, Toronto experienced a major flooding event thanks to a series of storms that dumped more rain on the city in one morning than we usually get in the entire month of July. And as so often happens when we have a major flooding event in Toronto, all of our beaches became unsafe. The reason for that is that in a lot of older parts of the city, the sanitary sewer system and the storm sewer system aren't separate. There's just one big pipe. Everything goes in it and it heads off to the treatment plant. But there's kind of a safety valve built in to avoid overloading the treatment plants at times of high flow. There are what are called combined sewer outfalls, which discharge some of the excess flow directly into waterways to relieve the pressure. That means poop. Ew. It's not really practical to fix this by ripping up large parts of the old city and replacing the combined sewer system with two separate sewer systems. So instead, the city has a project that's been underway for the last decade or so to improve its ability to handle the excess flow. One example of that is in behind me here. It's right next door to the sewage treatment plant we just visited. They're building a large underground tank into which the excess flow will be diverted at times of high flow. Some of the solids settle out and the water that's left, while still dirty, at least it doesn't have the solids in it, will get pumped to a separate high volume treatment facility 
located near Ashbridge's Bay, which will disinfect it with UV light before le letting it out into the same outfall pipe as the outfall from the main sewage treatment plant, which will then disperse it through a series of nozzles at the bottom of Lake Ontario, a few kilometers out into the lake. So it's not fully treated, but at least it's not a biohazard and it's dispersed well out into the lake. That's going to help a lot. And on that happy note, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, you know what to do. Please like and subscribe. <music>